So let's welcome Anya. Hello. So let's start with a question. How many of you had a psychedelic experience? Brilliant, amazing. So more, more than half of the room, that's fantastic. That makes my life a bit easier. So how many of you are aware of how we ended up in the psychedelic renaissance at the moment? Not many, just you, brilliant, you know too much. Okay, so I'll talk, you, I'll talk very briefly about myself to explain my own story, how I got to what I do. I'll talk a bit about the psychedelic society that I'm part of. And I'll talk to you about three areas of the psychedelic culture in the modern Western world. <coughs> and then very br briefly about how psychedelics actually improve, what happens in us that, um, that improves our mental health. And then let's talk about removing the stigma from psychedelics a bit and how we can all do it together. So I'm a filmmaker and creative content producer. Uh, after finishing my master's in film, I worked in Marie Curie uh, as a video person for a year and a half. So I thought I can change the world by working in a charity, and that quickly turned out to not be true. And that quickly ended up um, seeing charity work as, well, as another big corporate thing, actually, and not making a change. Um, so uh, I was really searching for something else I can do in life, and this is what I do now. So what I do now, I'm a co-director of the Psychedelic Society. Um, it's an organization that lobbies for legalization of psychedelics, at least rescheduling to start with. But we also believe that through safe and responsible use of psychedelics, we can build much more compassionate, kind, and beautiful society. And how we do that? I'll get to it very soon. So um, I'm also a director and producer of the film, The Psychedelic Renaissance, which I will show you the teaser of in the end. And, uh, well, yes, yeah, psychedelics helped me to heal my clinical depression. So about six years ago, I would never be here. I would probably be locked in my room, sad, crying, hiding, and just surviving until the next morning to go to work. Then survive work, then go back home and survive again. And it was all by surviving till another day. And I said to myself, I can't go on like this. This is too, this is bad. I can't think about suicide every day because that's not me. I wasn't that person a few years ago. What happened? So um, I decided to take LSD because 10 years earlier I took it as well and it kind of made me feel good. So I thought, ah, oh, there's nothing to lose. There's nothing else I can do. I'll just try yoga, meditation, therapy, everything. Nothing works. Let's do LSD. That single experience was a very high dose for me at the moment. I didn't expect it. Uh, for four hours I completely dissociated into the world of being in ancient Egypt and in Turkey, I was a Sufi, I was all kinds of people from history and I felt such a big power that humanity actually has done so many beautiful things. <coughs> then what came next, it showed me why I have depression, it showed me every step in my life that led me to my mental health problem. From then, it showed me what I have to do to undo this work. And the lesson was, <laughs> you have to trip every two or three months and go into your shadow, go into your darkness, and just like work it through, work it through, and as you will do it, you will get better. A year later, it was much better. I was going out to people and talking, but I was still depressed. So I went to a psychedelic retreat, one of those that you see probably advertised everywhere. But back then, it was kind of really secret thing to do. You had to know someone who knows someone, and it was really difficult. But then um, I had experience with 5 mil DMT. I don't know if anybody knows the Buffalo virus toad here, no? Yes, it's uh, one of, oh, hello. It's one of the, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the most uh, powerful substances in the world. So that um, experience, what it did, I immediately felt like I died. This is the end of my life, I don't exist. I'm not the body anymore. I'm some kind of energy floating in the universe. And it was not scary, it was really comforting. Um, because in that experience I felt power that I have to take responsibility of my own life and I can change everything in my life if I want to. So it's kind of this power of being God and feeling like, oh yes, I can do it, I can do it. After that day I woke up and I didn't have any social anxiety anymore. I actually could hug people and talk to them. I was like, wow, this is me, I can't, can't recognize myself. So that was a really strong experience. Since then I kept experimenting and depression is gone now. There's no social anxiety, it's completely gone. 
And what happened later, self-growth happened, so my cognitive functions got better, my presentation skills, my creativity, everything. Amazing. So, uh, while I'm here now, my mission is to remove stigma from psychedelics. I produce video content that basically educates people into what psychedelics are. As Darren said, the fear, oh my god, fear. I thought that LSD, I'm gonna take it and jump off the window when I was young, everybody thought so. Mushrooms, if you take too much, you'll die. This all kinds of stuff. If we remove this fear, then it's great. I'll get back to, to it later again, but let me very briefly take you through those three psychedelic eras. I'm not gonna go into every detail. I'm happy to share this presentation with you guys if you want. But basically it started with mescaline, uh, mescaline has been known for a very long time to Western pe people, but only in, uh, where is it? Uh, oh, I didn't put date, sorry, but yeah. One th er, in the end of 19th century, people started writing about mescaline in ju medical journals and it started being known, basically. And also, very good, Louis Lewin, first uh, classification of psychoactive drugs. He's the guy who did first classification of psychoactive drugs. So we have euphorians like heroin, inebriants like alcohol, and Fantastica, which later were called uh, psychedelics, but yeah, great names, Fantastica. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in 1892, mescaline was isolated from peyote, which allowed for more research into it. Uh, okay, we're getting into the second era. So you all probably know Albert Hoffman, who uh, synthesized, L synthesized LSD. Um, Face as a medicine for respiratory, pro respiratory problems. So interesting, but it didn't work, so uh, he put it on shelf. Years later, he thought, oh, I'm gonna kind of get back to this substance and see what I can do with it. And he accidentally ingested tiny dose of LSD and perception changes and said, oh, something's wrong with me. So a few days later, on the famous 19th of April, which will have a uh, birthday of that day, I mean, celebration that day again, he uh, asked his assistants in the lab to watch over him as he takes a bit of LSD. He takes 250 micrograms thinking that's a very low dose. Uh, then he figures out it's not a low dose at all. So uh, he has really a lot of hallucinations. He feels funny. He asks his assistants to escort him home. They get on a bicycle and there's a very famous bicycle ride, Albert Hoffman on acid. Um, right, so then, uh, as he figured out the power f how powerful the substance is, he uh, shares it with all the scientists around so they can start researching into it. And uh, you have first academic description of mental effects of LSD done in 1947, so that's quite a long time ago after the war. During the war there was a bit of a pause because there was no money and other problems. Uh, 1952, UK. Dr. Ronald Sanderson, he starts actually, actually developing research into psychotherapy for treatment-resistant patients. And he calls LSD psycholytic, mind loosening. So, let's go on. Uh, 50s and 60s, another doctor, Humphrey Osmond, he uses it to treat alcohol dependence, 50, 90% abstinence, amazing. In 1953, um, Osmond introduced Aldous, uh, Aldous Huxley sorry, to a psychedelics and they coined the term psychedelics from a phrase to fathom hell and soar angelic, just try a bit of psychedelics. Brilliant. So then 1953, Robert Gordon Wilson and his wife Val Valentina, they travel to Mexico, they meet Maria Sabina, they find magic mushrooms, they bring them to France. Roger Heim in France uh, start building massive uh, collection of mushrooms which I seen just a few months ago, it's still there very minging all <laughs> psilocybin mushrooms uh, in the base, not in the basement, in uh, some rooms of the museum there in, in Paris. Uh, and then Stanislav Grof in, in, in uh, Czech Republic. And obviously 1960, Timothy Leary, that you all know, he gets his hand on magic mushrooms and sets up Harvard psilocybin project. Then you have, uh, then he tries LSD in 1962. And by 1962, over two million different <laughs> states have taken LSD. And that's probably mostly due to Timothy Leary putting his hands on it. So he gets kicked out of Harvard for that, but he still spreads LSD wherever he wants, wherever he can. And uh, flourishing hippie movement, obviously, that you know about. 
um, you have Summer of Love, where white lighting LSD was given out to people freely, uh, so everybody was tripping together. And then 1966, LSD is made illegal, and that shuts off the research for years. So this is where we are now. 1976, MDMA is being resynthesized again. Then uh, it's given to a uh, psychotherapist, uh, Leo Zeff, this gentleman in Gus is here, and he has some initial good results. Psychotherapists are getting really excited about a new drug that is helping people who were resistant for ages for any treatment. And, uh, and, but it gets banned in 1984 because of the rave culture, in a way, because MDMA gets out to clubs and discos just like LSD did. So government doesn't like this, obviously. And then pressure group formed to find the ban uh, by Rick Dublin. And this is MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Does anyone know about them? Yeah, they're one of the biggest, they're the biggest, I think, uh, psychedelic research um, organization in the world. So what they do that, oh, sorry. They have a first uh, FDA-approved study uh, on DNA, on patients with terminal cancer. Then 1993, there's a few, few gentlemen, including uh, Dennis McKenna and David Nichols, open uh, Hefner Institute. It's a, it's a board of high-level clinicians and researchers that uh, kind of invent studies. They make sure that studies run properly and that you have placebo and control group and they kind of give um, tips to researchers how to conduct those studies. Uh, then you have 1995 uh, DMT research, start, uh, research starts and 1998 MAPS uh, gets ayahuasca studies on the go. 2000 Rick Dublin gets approval for MDMA for PTSD. Next but back to UK. Um, those are two people that are my biggest inspirations in life, Amanda Fielding and Professor Nutt. So uh, Amanda fi fa uh, I mean starts Beckley Foundation in 1998, and it's mainly to lobby for changes in the international drug laws, but soon, 2005, she meets Professor Nutt, and this is where magic starts. So they find the money and they find approvals to start all kinds of amazing studies into all substances, about neuroimaging, therapeutic <coughs> use, and uh, LSD, psilocybin, cannabis, DMT, and MDMA. And those studies run after today. There's loads of them. I don't have time to go through all of them, but if you do want to find out more, I need to show you this book that Darren had on screen, The Psychedelic Renaissance by Ben Sessa. Everything is in the book. Everybody should have it. Second edition is much better than first one, because it's edited by Nikki Weird from Breaking Convention. So moving on, uh, 2011 we have massive first um, conference in UK about psychedelic research. So people come and share research that empowers other people to do more research. Uh, and 2013, my psychedelic society is founded, uh, which uh, our goal is to join all the psychonauts together, help them come out and kind of build community so people feel not alienated. Because when you kind of get into psychedelic experience in the beginning, you kind of feel really alienated, your parents don't accept, your friends think you're weird, so you feel alone. And when you find a new community, like, oh, I'm not alone, actually, so that's a good thing. Uh, then we have another massive uh, conference starts in Prague, Beyond Psychedelics. Uh, and 2017, FDMA gra grants breakthrough therapy uh, for MDMA treatment of PTSD. <laughs> And now it's phase three trials, which means in probably two years it will be legal treatment in America, hopefully in UK as well. Um, yes, 2017 we're starting neuroimaging, fMRI scanner uh, for psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And I'll get to the results of this study soon because it's the most important actually for the psychedelic healing in my opinion. Chris Timmerman, 2017, starts a DMT in fMRI, so they give intravenous DMT to people and put them in a scanner and check what happens in the brain. And they kind of um, compare it to near-death experience. And then Ben Sessa, 2018, started his beautiful um, studies into he um, treating treatment-resistant patients uh, for alcoholism. And he has people who have 30 years of trauma <coughs> Men, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, all kinds of problems. Those people are really damaged by their life. And 
the results of the latest studies are crazy. And Ben didn't even actually, um, Ben was surprised himself. Uh, so I think out of 10 people, one person reached back to normal pattern of drinking. The rest stayed sober except three people, exceptional thing, three people went back to having a drink, but only occasional drink. So they didn't go back to al being alcoholics. And nobody really predicted this uh, result, uh, that they will win with their addiction. And that's the final goal, I think, in battling addiction. So yes, Ben calls psychedelic therapy pinnacle of neuroscience today. Uh, top universities, institutions are doing research in the world, almost like all of them, all the good ones. Uh, there's massive generation of people who come out and say about the psychedelic experience. There's Facebook groups, YouTube channels, all kinds of stuff like this. Uh, loads of amazing donations. There's two million donations from, I think, Dr. Bronner. There's massive uh, venture capitalists starting to actually invest in the psychedelic research. And yeah, it enters the mainstream. So as you see, all the newspaper, you've probably seen many of them already. Uh, Tim Ferriss makes a show, Michael Pollan writes a book about it, uh, Peter Thiel uh, funding psychedelic research, so this is basically at the moment very slowly entering mainstream, this is present now, it's not the future anymore. Uh, how psychedelics work? Okay, so people say they bring back the sense of wonder, so they stay on a pine cone for half an hour or a flower, you know, they see the trees and the sky si suddenly. The, it brings a feeling of oneness connected with the new universe, nature, God, whatever you want to call it, other people, just that we're all one. Uh, ego loss, uh, momentary ego loss, self-transcendence. Trans uh, uh, so you're overcoming limit of indi individual self. You don't see yourself as your own identity with my stress, my problems, my background, my trauma, but actually you see the bigger picture and increase openness and empathy. So you're more likely to speak about your problems and connect with other people. So this is all anecdotal research from studies and from internet that I gathered. But, so, the results of the psilocybin study for depression, which Darren also mentioned, psychedelics reset the brain networks associated with depression, effectively enabling patients to be lifted from the depressed state. So I'll show you the brain scans in a minute. So initially, brain disintegrates completely and then integrates back after the calm down, but it's not the same anymore. They scan people before and after and during the experience. Uh, and when they compare the images, they see quite big changes. And patients reported benefits lasted up to five weeks after the treatment. So that's quite long. Um, so this is your brain on placebo. This is your brain on psilocybin. Uh, all kinds of networks start firing up and yes, brain basically is uh, disintegrating before it can integrate again. The same with LSD, this is the placebo, this is LSD, whole brain activates everywhere. Uh, and this is from Robin Cochran Harris, psilocybin may be giving these individuals the temporary kickstart, they need to break out of their depressive state. And this is key thing. Because I think exactly, psilocybin, I'm sorry, all psychedelics open this window when you are really motivated to do changes. But it's not a long time. You have about a month, I think, to do it. If you don't do it, you'll fall back into bad habits. I can see it by myself and everybody around me. But if you do hard work with it, meditation, yoga, going out, reading, doing things, then it works only this way. So, every, so what I'm saying is, the teacher and the healer is inside, is not the mushrooms in my opinion. They are a tool to help you find the healer out in you. And removing stigma from psychedelics. So yes, as I told you, I feel like we have the duty to talk about our experiences to people. Uh, at breaking convention, somebody asked Dennis McKenna, how can we leave the stigma? And he says, yeah, just open up about your use. Are you a lawyer? Talk that you do psychedelics. Are you a doctor? Tell them about it. Because we need people in suits to come out and say we do it too. It's not just hippies and Woodstock and whatever other festivals, you know. Um, so my mission is to develop free edu educational content about psychedelics to give people tools to spread awareness. I've, um, I've already um, released a few trailers for my film. And the feedback was amazing. People say to me, oh, I showed your teaser to my mother, and she's this conservative Indian woman, and she hates all drugs. But now she's like opened up to it, and she 
supports me in seeking the, ther uh, the therapy with psychedelics. So this is kind of a result I want to get from people. It gets me really excited when I hear things like this. Uh, my own mother now is a big fan of cannabis, but he, she hated cannabis all her life. But now, because of the studies and stuff, she's like, oh, actually, this is medicine. It's good. Um, <laughs> so uh, I raise. So I'm planning to raise public awareness and change the misconceptions and all, change all this fear that people have around psychedelics. Uh, then I want to see the outdated drug laws change due to the public demand. And then in the end, I want to see legal and licensed therapi therapists doing psychedelic practice. Because at the moment, everything is in the underground. And it's very dangerous. A lot of people get abused. A lot of people get uh, re-traumatized because there is no right set and setting. I've done all my psychedelic experiences myself, but it took me two years. If I had a therapist with me, it would probably take me a month to get out of my depression. So two years and one month, big difference. Questions? Uh, what, um, you, you concentrated mostly on depression. What, what about other psychiatric conditions? Uh, so mania, which is almost the opposite of depression. Mania? Yeah. Oh, mania is a big problem in the psychedelic movement, actually, because we, we figure that actually psychedelics boost mania. So psychedelic psychiatrists. Depends who you are, that's going to bring it out. And I do see a lot of maniacs in the movement, unfortunately. <laughs> and I myself, I think, had a bit of a one-month mania kind of episode, but I see everybody gets out of it slowly. So it's like a phase that everybody goes through, and then it kind of... I don't know about it. I don't think there's any research. As you know, we need uh, more research into it, so I would love to see... Uh, research into mania. Can I just take that point up actually? Um, it, because it kind of ties in with something that I was going to say. Probably the most effective treatment that is in mainstream psychiatry at the moment, although it is also stigmatized because of a variety of things, is ECT. Um, and ECT, it's very interesting what you said about the brain imaging from LSD, the whole brain firing, disintegration, reintegration, because that is very similar to how ECT works. Obviously, it induces. Uh, basically an epileptic seizure in the brain, the whole brain fires, and then it all goes very quiet, and then it sort of almost reboots. It's basically like turning yeah. it off and on. And that does work for uh, mania, and it does work for schizophrenia. Um, but it's interesting that psychedelic drugs, as far as I'm aware, the very much recommendation is that they're not to be used in the psychotic type conditions. But maybe there is scope for it if they do work in a similar way to ECT, because ECT definitely I asked Ben Sessa about this actually because he's a psychiatrist, um, and uh, there are some reason, there are some studies from the 60s about schizophrenia and psychedelics, and they are beneficial. But because there is no research behind it, proper research, we cannot claim those things. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it's advised not to uh, give psychedelics to psychotic people. You know, the same with autistic people. Autistic people they benefit from MDMA because the empathy gets better and everything, but it's still not research enough to talk about it, so we need to be very careful with those claims. But the uh, interesting thing is with alcoholics. Um, uh, so, you know, um, delirium tremens, I don't know if anybody uh, knows what that is, but it's kind of really severe psychotic episode for alcoholics. And many people who get out of this uh, get out of her alcoholism. It helps them to kind of beat their habit. And in the beginning, they thought that if you take psychedelics, they will do kind of same thing. They will really put you in psychotic state and shake you up to get you out. But it is kind of similar in a way. It, the, all this like resetting of the brain, it is in a way putting you in some kind of psychosis, you know. And then you get out of it better. I, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm only, you know, look at the evidence that's happening and speak to scientists. One more question now, then we'll show the video. Um, I saw on your slides some of the news articles were talking about microdosing. I was wondering if you think that has any benefits for mental health, because all I've really seen is people talking about, you know, improving that performance in the workplace. Oh, and yeah. And stuff. This is our society, isn't it? Let's find a drug that will work better and more. Uh, I am speaking a lot with people who research into microdosing, and at the moment we don't know. We need to do a lot of research. There's anecdotal data that people get more creative productive, but we think it's an end result of something else. What microdosing does, from what we see from initial studies, is that it puts you in the now. It makes you present, makes you mindful. And from there, everything else comes. You know, creativity, productivity comes from being in the now and not being um, 
you know, busy with thinking about what somebody said to you yesterday or how you hurt someone a year ago. So, yeah, but uh, we need to see about microdosing. Lots of good discussion there. Let's uh, see at least a teaser of the teaser. <laughs> There's subtitles even here, so. I'm going to stop it there. So, there's more to see of the teaser. Uh, I encourage you all to check it out. You can easily find it online because there's more to be said yeah, yeah, all yeah. around. But I think let's give Anna a big round of applause for sharing so much. <laughs> we'll have more questions shortly. But there's a, a third dimension to what we're going to talk about now. Uh, almost uh, a broader picture, uh, you know, it's a very broad already, but there's an even broader picture which we can reach to. Uh, which uh, Matthew Goslin is going to talk us through.